Good morning and welcome again to the second webinar series of the WHO Clinical Management of COVID-19. Our webinar um, this morning is uh, entitled Implementing WHO COVID-19 Guidelines. We thank all of the 182 attendees thus far are registered in Zoom, Climbing. Um, this comes from the latest clinical management update uh, released last uh, May 27. And um, you already have the agenda for this week-long series. We begin today, Monday, always at 11 o'clock uh, in the morning, Philippine time. That's uh, eight hours ahead of uh, Greenwich Mean Time, so GMT plus eight. We welcome all those from the Philippines and also our colleagues uh, from other countries uh, signing in and uh, helping to learn more about this new update. For today's uh, session, we have Drs. Gary Kuniyoshi and uh, Sophie Dennis, our uh, speakers from the WHO Regional Office for the Western Pacific, to give us um, the updates. Uh, Gary will be delivering the presentation, so our format is 30 minutes of a presentation, followed by 30 minutes of question and answer. This early, I wanted to introduce all participants to the Q&A function. So at the bottom of your Zoom screens, there is a button there that says Q&A. Um, even while uh, Dr. Kuriyoshi is giving the presentation, you can already put your questions. It will be recorded. And for everyone else who sees a question, if you think it is interesting or you also share the same question, you can always upvote it and it goes higher on the list that we can see. And we can ask later on at around 11.30 onwards. So in those few seconds that I've been giving my spiel, the audience is now at 219. And uh, perhaps let's go straight to the meat of the matter. And I'm turning it over to you, Gary. Thank you, Albert. Are you able to see my slides? Yes. It's on. Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon. Um, today we're going to go over the updates on clinical management of uh, COVID-19 guidelines. Um, we will review the updated management of severe COVID-19 infections. Um, there are not a lot of key changes um, to the management of severe and critically ill um, but rather expansion or supplements to the previous recommendations um, in regards to oxygen therapy, sepsis and septic shock management, respiratory failure and acute respiratory uh, distress syndrome or ARDS, and then ethical considerations in uh, COVID-19. The third revision of interim guidance from WHO clinical management of COVID-19 there are some entirely new sections, um, including neurological and mental manifestations, rehabilitation, palliative care. Um, but the, the other remaining sections are expanded, and they include the management of the severe and critically ill COVID-19, um, including severe pneumonia, ARDS, and septic shock. And that's what we're going to be covering today. So COVID-19 disease severity is a spectrum of mild, moderate, and severe disease. Uh, mild disease is symptomatic disease without any evidence of pneumonia or hypoxia. Uh, moderate disease is pneumonia, but without any signs of severe pneumonia. Uh, specifically, does not require oxygen supplementation. Severe disease is severe pneumonia or other complications, including ARDS and sepsis or septic shock. There are many other complications associated with severe COVID-19 disease, including venous thromboembolism and acute kidney injury, and others associated with either moderate to severe disease, such as acute cardiac injury and neurological and mental manifestations. What we still currently understand about the spectrum of disease comes from this large report from the Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention. They classified mild as non-pneumonia or mild pneumonia, and they classified severe similarly um, to what we now understand with uh, severe tachypnea, with a respiratory rate greater or equal to 30, and hypoxemia, 
um, based off of a uh, PO2 over FiO2 ratio. Um, they classified critical as respiratory failure, septic shock, or multiple organ failure. So this is still what we understand about the natural history of the disease. 80% will develop mild or moderate disease. 15% um, will develop severe disease or severe pneumonia. And 5% will become critically ill and develop organ failure requiring uh, some type of ventilatory support or life support. Um, a question we do not have the full answer to is what percentage are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic? Um, some of the data that we have from cruise ships indicate it may be somewhere around 18%. Other studies show it may be as high as 25 to 50%. So approximately 20% will develop severe disease that requires some level of oxygen support, either oxygen supplementation or ventilatory support. Um, all areas where patients may be cared for should be equipped with pulse oximeters, functioning oxygen systems such as liquid oxygen or concentrators and oxygen delivery um, interfaces. Um, this includes any areas in the hospital, um, including the emergency units, the critical care units, primary care outpatient clinics, as well as the pre-hospital settings. Um, also, the ad hoc community facilities that may receive patients with severe COVID-19. So it is important to know your oxygen capacity um, to evaluate your facility oxygen system and supply. Um, whether you use an oxygen plant system, liquid oxygen storage, a cylinder or concentrator system, it is important to know what you have and how to increase the supply. Um, particularly when you're considering delivering high flow nasal oxygen um, or non-invasive ventilation outside the usual settings, you need to evaluate your oxygen capacity. Um, it's important to ensure that you can adequately provide the the higher flow rates required for these devices. So the recommendation is to use disposable single-use oxygen delivery interfaces, so nasal cannula, venturi mask, or mask with reservoir bag. Um, if possible, use either disposable or dedicated equipment, such as stethoscopes, um, finger pulse eximeters, and thermometers. So this is all regarding the health facility setting. Um, at the present time, there is no evidence to guide the use of pulse oximeters in the home setting. Um, in these situations, should consider alternative delivery platforms such as home-based uh, phone, um, telemedicine, or community outreach teams to assist um, with the monitoring. So the oxygen indications. Um, there should be immediate administration of supplemental oxygen therapy to any patient. This is adults and children with emergency signs. And these emergency signs include respiratory distress, altered mental status, or shock. Also to any patient with a sa oxygen saturation of less than 90%. So it's an important point that clinical signs are not reliable indicators of hypoxemia. And this is the so-called silent hypoxemia. So what is the oxygen titration level? What is the target? So titrate oxygen to target an SpO2 greater or equal to 90% in adults and children. In pregnant patients should titrate to 92 to 95%. If there are signs of organ failure, the, the target should be greater or equal to 94%. So although other organizations may target higher saturation levels, it is widely accepted that a saturation level of 90% or more is sufficient to deliver oxygen to tissues. And then other organizations may indicate a maximal oxygen level. Um, it should be understood from the recommendation that an active, adequate oxygen 
in a stable patient, this is children and non-pregnant adults, is 90%. So equal to 90% should be adequate in adults and children and non-pregnant adults um, that are stable. Um, adequate oxygenation in multi-organ failure, critically ill, should be 90, 94%. It also says or higher, but it should be understood that 94% should be adequate. Once the patient is stable, you should target 90%. So I'm missing an equal there. So it says greater than 90% in stable patients, but it should say greater or equal to 90% in stable non-pregnant adults. In adults, you should consider positioning techniques such as high supported sitting. Um, this may optimize oxygenation, ease the breathlessness, and reduce the energy expenditure. Um, prone positioning, which is placing the patient on their stomach, um, it is recommended for moderate to severe ARDS. But in awake, spontaneously breathing patient, it is not currently recommended um, outside of clinical trials. So this is still what we understand about the severity of COVID-19 disease thus far. Um, about 20% will develop disease requiring supplemental oxygen or ventilatory support, and about 5% will require ICU support. So let's talk about COVID-19 and septic shock. So the sepsis three definition um, is recommended, which is a suspected or documented infection with an acute life-threatening organist function caused by a dysregulated host response. And the estimated prevalence of sepsis um, with COVID-19 is highly variable, um, anywhere between one to 20% um, is reported in recent publications. Um, Septic shock, the definition, is a subset of sepsis with higher mortality in which vasopressors are required and an elevated lactate level is present. So the principles of sepsis management are first, recognition of sepsis. And the second is give appropriate antimicrobials along with initial the fluid bolus and start vasopressors if needed within the first hour. Um, third is give a targeted resuscitation immediately. So these are the targets of resuscitation. Um, these are based from clinical trials and five specific targets are recommended. The first is improved blood pressure. Um, the mean arterial pressure, which is a true driving pressure of perfusion, or you can also use a systolic blood pressure greater than 100. Um, adequate urine output, which is per hour greater than or equal to 0 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour. So in the average size adult, that would be um, approximately 30 milliliters per hour. A skin exam, which does include a capillary refill and peripheral pulses, Improved sensorium um, using whatever standardized scale, such as a Glasgow Coma Score, and normalized lactate if the initial level was high. The recommendation is to use cautious fluid management in patients with COVID-19, um, specifically when they don't have tissue hyperperfusion and they are fluid responsive. The recommendation is to give a fluid bolus of 250 to 500 milliliters or 15 to 30 minutes in the adult as the first fluid challenge. I'm also called a bolus or loading. Um, if shock persists, then giving additional fluid challenges of 250 to 500 milliliters in the adult um, in the first 30 to 60 minutes as long as there is a clinical response. When to stop giving fluids, um, you stop once the targets of resuscitation are met. So the five targets that we listed previously, once those are met, you should stop giving fluids. Additional 
the um, if there's any signs of fluid overload or if they are no longer fluid responsive. So monitor your patients for signs of fluid overload, such as pulmonary edema, and such as uh, lung crackles on auscultation, or if you see increase in filtrates on chest x-ray, or a very high central venous pressure if you have a central line in place, as long as this is properly interpreted. For vasopressors, the first choice vasopressor is um, norepinephrine. And the reason is this is a more potent vasoconstrictor. It has less of what's called chronotropic effects um, than something like dopamine. So there's less increase in heart rate. And the second choice is epinephrine or could use a fixed dose of vasopressin. Um, again, dopamine should be avoided um, due to the tachyrrhythmia, um, especially in the context of COVID-19 infection in older persons um, with a possibility of acute cardiac injury and being on uh, prorhythmic medications and the side effects from them, uh, dopamine should be avoided. Um, an adjunctive measure um, that could be considered is another anotropic agent, uh, dobutamine. Um, dobutamine is a strong anotrope and mild vasodilator. Um, there is a risk of tachyrrhythmia with dopamine um, and it can cause some hypotension um, because it is a weak vasodilator. So the COVID-19 ICU experience thus far, um, about 5% will require ICU. Um, a pretty large percentage, about 70% may develop ARDS. About 25% will develop some type of acute organ injury, including acute kidney injury, cardiac injury, or liver. And the mortality is uh, variable. Um, some of the recent reports indicate a more IC mortality of 50 to 60 percent, and then other studies show um, 30 percent. But it has uh, varied substantially in different case series um, throughout the pandemic. In regards to ARDS management, um, the first uh, principle is to recognize ARDS early. And we use the Berlin definition. That's the one that's recommended. It's uh, the timing, which is an acute process. So you have bilateral opacities by chest X-ray or CAT scan. And the origin of edema is the lungs. So it's not cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And then there's severe hypoxemia based off of the PO2 and FiO2 ratio. So there's what's called a Kigali modification of the Berlin definition. The Kigali modification is for when chest imaging is limited and or you're not able to obtain an AVG and a PO2 is not available. So the SPO2 or FiO2 ratio of less than 315 suggests ARDS. Um, including in non-ventilated patients. And then the use of lung ultrasound um, is recommended with the Kigali definition. So the Kigali modification um, uses lung ultrasound in figure B and C. It demonstrates these vertical artifacts or B lines, sometimes called lung rockets. This indicates uh, alveolar interstitial filling um, figure D shows consolidation with a tissue density. Um, so both of these, all three of these, B, C, and D would be consistent with a lung ultrasound finding consistent with ARDS. Um, figure E is a pleural fusion, and that would not be consistent with the Kigali definition of ARDS. So next principles of ARDS management are to initiate ventilatory support without delay. Um, 
Hypoxemic respiratory failure in ARDS commonly results from uh, interpulmonary, what we call VQ mismatch or shunt. And this usually requires mechanical ventilation or invasive mechanical ventilation with lung protective ventilation strategy. So the implementation of a lung protective ventilation or invasive mechanical ventilation using lower tidal volumes and lower inspiratory pressures is a strong recommendation from most clinical guidelines for ARDS. And it is also suggested for patients with sepsis-induced respiratory failure who do not meet ARDS criteria. And the initial tidal volume is six milliliters per kilogram predicted body weight, but can be adjusted up to eight milliliters of per kilogram predicted body weight if there's uh, undesirable side effects, such as uh, dyssynchrony or severe um, acidosis. So most ventilator protocols, and um, they're called ARDSNET protocols, utilize this. So once again, these targets of lung protective ventilation are tidal volume of six milliliters per kilogram predicted body weight, also a pressure called a plateau pressure of less than 30 centimeters of water pressure. Um, so although high driving pressure, which is the plateau pressure minus PEEP, um, may in some studies more accurately predict increased mortality in ARDS compared with just looking at the high tidal volume or plateau pressure, um, we don't have data from randomized control trials. Um, that allow us to have a good strategy to target driving pressures at the current time. So for ARDS, the best evidence is for targeting tidal volume and plateau pressure. The oxygen target in lung protective ventilation is down to 88%, um, with a range of 88 to 93%. Um, you should use the lowest FiO2 and PEEP combination to maintain this oxygen level. And there are two PEEP tables. Um, set the PEEP according to the severity of oxygen impairment and titrate it to the lowest amount. However, for moderate to severe ARDS, it is recommended to use the higher PEEP tables. So we're going to go on to Airborne precautions. So aerosol generating procedures include intubation, non-invasive ventilation, tracheotomy, CPR, manual ventilation, and bronchoscopy. There is some uncertainty around the potential for aerosolization of non-invasive and high-flow nasal cannula. Um, but at the present time, whenever these procedures are performed, precautions Airborne precautions should be done to safely complete these procedures. Um, at this time, there is not sufficient evidence to classify nebulizer therapy as an aerosol generating procedure. So for all aer aerosol generating procedures, using airborne, airborne precautions um, means using particulate respirators, gown, eye protection and gloves. An airborne precaution room means a negative pressure room with a minimum of six to 12 air changes per hour, or at least 60 liters per second per patient in the facilities with natural ventilation. Um, also avoiding unnecessary individuals in the room. Other considerations do include high flow oxygen systems. So high flow nasal cannula or heated high flow nasal cannula. And what this machine does is it infuses humidity, also increases flow. And the oxygen from the wall or tank is humidified and pushed in at a high flow rate. And this does many good things for the patient. And it can improve oxygen delivery. The heat and the humidity is much more comfortable and prevents the dryness and the flow creates a reservoir or sink of oxygen and does improve what's called FRC or functional residual capacity 
and improve the debt space and provides a little bit of what's called positive inventory pressure, which we called PEEP. So in selected patients with COVID-19 and mild ARDS, a trial of high flow nasal oxygen can be used. Um, patients specifically with hemodynamic instability, multi-organ failure or abnormal mental status should not receive nasal high flow oxygen. So once again, can be used in selected patients with COVID-19 and mild ARDS. A trial of high flow nasal oxygen can be used. There are certain contraindications to use of high flow nasal oxygen. And patients receiving a trial of high flow nasal oxygen should be in a monitored setting and cared for by personnel that are experienced with high flow nasal oxygen and capable of performing endotracheal intubation in case that is needed. In, patient, in case the patient deteriorates or does not improve after a short trial. And the short trial is usually about one hour. So also in selected patients with COVID-19 and mild ARDS, a trial of non-invasive ventilation or continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP or bi-level positive airway pressure, also called BiPAP, may be used. And also these patients should be awake, cooperative, hemodynamically stable, without urgent need for intubation. There are risks with using non-invasive ventilation, and they include higher tidal volumes. Um, you could transmit pressure that's injurious to the transpulmonary. Um, you can have skin breakdown from the mask, um, and the patient may have increased energy expenditure. So patients should be closely monitored, um, cared for by experienced personnel, capable of performing endotracheal intubation, and this trial should be um, for about one hour. So looking at recommendations from various organizations regarding non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal cannula, um, I have the recommendations that say no or not recommended in red. So WHO does recommend in selected patients consideration of both either non-invasive such as CPAP or BiPAP or high flow nasal cannula. The caveats are with close monitoring and trials limited to one hour. So in adult patients with severe ARDS, um, prone ventilation for 12 to 16 hours is recommended. Um, the application of prone ventilation for 16 hours per day uh, may be considered in pediatric patients with severe ARDS, um, but also you need to consider the sufficient resources and expertise to safely perform it have a protocol and the uh, adequate uh, PPE. Um, there is little evidence on prone positioning in pregnant patients with ARDS. Um, this could be considered in early pregnancy. Um, pregnant women in the third trimester may benefit from being placed in the lateral decubitus position. In patients with moderate severe ARDS, um, neuromuscular blockade by continuous infusion should not routinely be used. Um, there was a trial that found that this strategy improved survival um, in adult patients with moderate severe ARDS without causing uh, significant weakness. Um, but results of a more recent larger trial found that the use of neuromuscular blockade was not associated with the survival benefit. However, in cases of refractory hypoxemia hypox, um, or severe hypercapnia, you may consider um, intermittent or continuous neuromuscular blockade um, in patients with moderate severe ARDS. So in summary, in most patients with ARDS, um, the recommendation is still to 
do invasive mechanoventilation with lung protective ventilation strategy. This is the preferred treatment. Non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal oxygen can be used in selected patients with mild ARDS. And clinical trial evidence has shown that implementation of lung protective ventilation does save lives when compared with usual care. And currently, there are no trial results comparing lung protective ventilation with high flow or non-invasive, but these are currently being performed. However, they're not uh, able to get the um, number of patients um, enrolled in the studies. So we may not get the answers to this question um, in the next couple months. So well, let's talk about the ethical considerations that affect um, all persons affected by COVID-19. So basic healthcare services um, need to address the ethical considerations. Um, and these include the equal moral respect where every person is equally valuable. Um, the duty of care. Um, every patient is owed the best possible care and treatment available in circumstances. Non-abandonment, um, this falls from the consideration of equal moral respect and duty of care that no person in need of medical care should be ever be neglected or abandoned. The protection of the community and confidentiality. So a little bit more about non-abandonment. So it follows from the consideration of equal moral respect and duty of care that no person in need of medical care should ever be neglected or abandoned. Um, there are some experiences in Europe and the Americas that have demonstrated um, some older persons, critically ill persons with COVID-19 um, have died alone um, due to strict adherence to visitation policies. So WHO recommendation is that palliative care should be accessible for all patients with respiratory failure for whom ventilatory support will be withheld or withdrawn. And then care will extend to families and friends of patients and options to maintain communication with their family members. Um, and these should be explored. Um, WHO is currently working on further specific guidance on this particular issue. So regarding scarce resource allocation. So each institution, each facility should establish a plan for what to do in situations of resource scarcity. This should cover the allocation or access to critical medical interventions such as oxygen, intensive care beds and or ventilators. So it is recommended that it be clear when the decision making will move from routine allocation to pandemic allocation, so that, al so that institutions do not move too soon to res restrict access in anticipation of possible scarcity that might not arise. So it should be clear what that tipping point is to change to pandemic allocation. Um, some examples are um, the declaration by the Ministry of Health or other authority, or when you reach a specific state um, specific use of the number of beds, ICU beds, or ventilator capacity. So the commonly accepted principles for scarce resource allocation include the principle of utility. So the principle of utility is commonly accepted and justified during public health emergencies. So this aims at saving the greatest number of lives. It focuses on interventions to patients that have the highest chance of success and survival, and less priority is given to those patients who are less likely to recover. So this is what's known as short-term survival. Next is the principle of maximum life years. Um, this principle, maximum life years saved, aims at refining the principle of utility by considering the number of life years in addition to life saved. For example, if you have two patients, they have the same short-term survival, but one has comorbid disease that limits their long-term survival, whereas the other one is healthy, then the priority should be given to the healthier person to save more life years. 
this is what's called as known as long-term survival. Um, the last principle is the life cycle principle, also known as a fair innings or intergenerational equity principle. So its aim is to give each individual an equal opportunity to live through various phases of life. The priority is given to younger patients and to children relative to older patients. So this principle um, is a little controversial. Um, it may be considered discriminatory against older patients older people. Some additional um, considerations in regards to triage, should certain populations be prioritized? So should pregnant women be prioritized? Um, there should be some considerations for special and vulnerable populations such as the pediatric patients, older patients, and pregnant women. Um, there is debate about the what's known as a two patient model for pregnant women and its relevance, uh, relevance to triage. Um, there is currently no known difference between the clinical manifestations of COVID-19 in pregnant women and non-pregnant adults of reproductive age. So the clinical benefit and survival prognosis, which is the short-term and long-term survival prospects, should determine the access to ICU for pregnant women, as it is for all patients. So based on this, you should use the clinical benefit and survival prognosis that you would use for any patient. Some additional ethical principles include the ethical principle of reciprocity, which implies that society should support persons who face a disproportionate burden or risk in protecting the public good. So what reciprocity means is making a fitting and proportional return for contributions that people have made. So that this principle justifies giving priority access um, to scarce resources to person who assume the greater risk. These are healthcare workers or frontline healthcare workers because they assume more risk to their own health or life contributing to the outbreak response. So this Ethical principle of reciprocity implies that society should support persons who place who face this disproportionate risk. Example are things such as vaccines or post-exposure prophylaxis for healthcare workers. There's also a precautionary principle that acknowledges that measures often must be taken in the face of uh, scientific uncertainty. This is what we have now. However, it emphasizes caution, pausing and review before leaping into use of innovative products. Um, some additional ethical considerations are corruption in the healthcare sector, um, which may be exacerbated during infectious disease outbreaks um, if a large number of individuals are competing for limited resources. So efforts should be made to ensure that persons involved in the application of resource um, allocation systems do not accept bribes or engage in other corrupt activities. Um, to the extent possible, there should be a separation of the personnel familiar with the medical triage criteria and allocation protocols and who make the decisions and the clinical management team. So I want to thank you for your attending this webinar and listening. Um, what you are doing is uh, strengthening your health system by uh, being here today. And this is our a statement by um, our WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus. Um, the world should invest in health system strengthening and fixing the roof um, before the rain comes. We are only as strong as the weakest link. We need to invest in preparedness and solidarity so that the whole world is prepared. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gary Kuniyoshi. And that was a very comprehensive <laughs> presentation, but I, I'd like to also underscore the fact that this is the second of a uh, series of webinars, the first one being done in April for an earlier version of the guidance.
So um, there have been, first off, we would like to apologize for the technical glitch. I realized that not everyone got the link on time. So right now we have 484 or still climbing number of participants. And we thank you so much for joining in. Even if you came in late, we apologize for that. Definitely the webinar itself uh, has been recorded and will be uploaded and the link will be sent to everyone along with the slides of uh, Dr. Kuniyoshi and the other uh, presenters as we discuss it uh, over the week. So um, turning over to the questions, um, the best use of this webinar platform would be to type in your question in the, using the Q&A button at the bottom. So there is a Q&A uh, chat box where when you open it, you can type a new question or if you see among the existing questions something which interests you, you can always upvote it and it will um, pop up higher on the list that we will be reading and we will be answering. So let's begin with uh, by asking what Desiree Daniega is asking. Can you please comment on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO treatment for management of severe RDS in COVID-19 patients? Gary? So the WHO recommendation is to consider its use when you have refractory hypoxemia. So these are very severe um, ARDS patients. Um, that's the type of patient. Um, you should also, uh, of course, have, if you have the expertise, um, it's something that you, you can consider. Um, but uh, there are some risks with uh, transferring the patient to another facility. Um, the recent studies that were done did not show, they're not large, but they did not show a uh, reduced mortality. Um, there was a reduced um, composite outcome that did consist of mortality, um, and they did some post um, hoc analysis that, ended, that showed that would be likely to reduce mortality, but the recent studies uh, did actually did not show I don't know if they are powered enough to show that was reduced mortality with the use of ECMO in uh, refractory hypoxemic patients. All right. Um, so I'm re reading a question uh, from the chat box. Uh, just to quickly answer it, uh, Divina Chu is asking if is wondering if there will also be COVID infection guidelines in children. A um, quick answer to that is yes, uh, there will be. That will be the topic for the Friday webinar, and we will be having. UNICEF and UNFPA and someone from the DOH uh, to join us to discuss that. All right, um, looking at the Q&A box, um, Arthur Roman is asking, any suggestion for the criteria in discontinuing antibiotics for COVID-19 as part of antimicrobial stewardship? So what about the use of antibiotics? Gary? So Hi, it's Sophie here. So happy to answer. And then Gary, okay, if you Sophie. have anything else, um, then please go ahead. And um, so from the new guidance that's been released, um, they have been reviewing um, co-infections in um, COVID-19. Um, and what they've looked at and what WHO has recommended is that in mild cases, so that's what um, Dr. Gary was discussing as to the definition of mild um, or mild pneumonia is not to use any antibiotics prophylactically. Um, in moderate cases, it would be needed to be considered on a case-by-case -case, um, basis um, and especially looking at those that are of sort of more vulnerable populations, so those who are elderly, those with comorbidities, um, those that are pediatric um, or, or in pregnant women. So it's really taking it by case by case, um, really to reduce antimicrobial um, resistance and also just saying that there, there isn't any benefit at this time um, of, of adding it in. Thank you. Gary, anything else to add to that? Yeah, the specific guidance on the duration is for, in, when you're using empiric antibiotics, of course, uh, they say sh as short as possible. Um, and they also indicate generally five to seven days. This is based off of uh, um, numerous uh, studies that are cited. So that's the general guidance from uh, WHO uh, regarding the duration. All right, so since we touched a bit on uh, medications, uh, just a quick question from Catherine Hambig. 
Has the WHO confirmed any prophylactic interventions aside from general public health measures to prevent the development of COVID symptoms among the general population? We're talking here, for example, of uh, zinc, vitamins D, C, others. Any comment on that, uh, Gary or Sophie? So to my knowledge, the WHO doesn't recommend um, any additional supplements at this time, but it really does want to reinforce the need um, for just um, general well-being and looking from a holistic response. Um, so looking at uh, a healthy, balanced diet where possible, keeping up with exercise um, and keeping active. And then from a mental well-being point of view, ensuring that you're um, speaking to family and friends um, and, and staying well connected, ideally um, remotely and, and using technology. Um, but no specific supplements um, are recommended at this time. Thanks. Okay. I'm seeing a lot of questions on ethics. Don't worry, we will be answering them uh, as part of the webinar. It's just that we're doing a little bit uh, by thematic area. So I'm touching on the therapeutics now. So Eric Diaz is asking, can you comment on the use of toclizumab in safety and treatment efficacy during the cytokine storm phase of COVID-19? I'll go ahead again. Um, again, Gary, just just um, interject if, if you if you want to add anything. So in terms of um, monoclonal antibodies and other therapies, um, there is no recommendation at the time um, other than that these should be used within clinical trials um, so that for um, the, the global greater good, we can really ascertain um, the benefits of medicines such as these. Um, we know there are studies ongoing um, and, and we're waiting to get results. Um, but in terms of use on a um, individual compassionate use, um, what we still recommend is, um, whilst it may be licensed in some countries, I'm, I, I, I can't say exactly which ones, um, to, to keep them within clinical trials to get that, that robust data is, is, is the best um, option. Either. All right, so quickly to follow up on that, Sophie, um, because Patricia Piotrico, sorry, is asking any updates on the WHO Solidarity Trial? Um, so recent updates from the trial, and I know there's um, a, a little bit of um, controversy and changes that has been made in terms of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine in the arms of the Therapeutic Solidarity Trial 1. Um, currently, they're not enrolling new patients within this, but those that have been um, allocated to that arm of the trial are to continue it until it's ended. Um, and we're just waiting to get the, the rest of the results from that. Um, we're hoping, sort of, um, whilst it's being reviewed by external specialists, that we should get some input as to the preliminary results um, in the next couple of weeks. They, 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 they're aiming for mid-June, but we'll just have to wait um, and happy to update. Otherwise, the other arms are still ongoing um, and as of this stage there hasn't yet been added any new um, therapeutics to, to, to the trial arms. Thanks. All right and this next question I'm going to ask is a follow-on to the previous one on the antibiotics. So I, I think Gary can answer this. So Arthur Roman is asking, so in the guidelines um, we may have to put in parenthesis antibiotics parenthesis if indicated because um, Right now, it seems to be that antibiotic is under the standard of care and the impression is to start everyone on antibiotics. Is that right, Gary? Only if indicated? So my talk today was on severe COVID-19. So specifically in severe COVID-19, it does include um, sepsis and septic shock. If you have uh, septic shock, in sepsis, the recommendation is to start empiric antimicrobials. When we're talking about mild COVID-19 and moderate COVID-19, then antimicrobials are not recommended unless you suspect the bacterial infection. All right, next two questions would be about uh, fluids. Uh, it may be related or maybe it's not, but it's both about fluids. So Alvin M. is asking, uh, good day, I'm a nephro nurse. May I ask if there is a special guideline for the management of COVID patient undergoing hemodialysis? That's the first. And then the second question is from Jenny Galia. How about COVID co-infection with dengue virus? Any comments on fluid management? So in an HD patient and in a dengue patient? 
Well, that's a good question. Um, that for the hemodialysis patient, there is not specific guidance on that. Um, in your dialysis patients, of course, they don't urinate. So you're going to be losing that um, parameter as one of your resuscitation targets. Um, also, there's if you um, give too much fluid, you're not able to, to take it back unless you dialyze them. So you have that additional um, caution. Um, the recommendation is in all patients to use cautious fluid management. Um, uh, in, so, so what that means is um, if you don't have any indication of, uh, of their targets being met, um, and they're, fluid, they're not fluid responsive, then you should not give any fluid. And those are other markers that you would use. Um, for the uh, other question, for the dengue question, um, there is not specific guidance uh, for COVID-19 and um, concomitant uh, dengue infection. Um, I'm sure as you realize that they have their own type of fluid management um, with the dengue infections. And so you would follow a, uh, a dengue protocol. Um, if you have a person with a uh, COVID-19 and co-infection. All right, next one. Um, a little bit provocative, but it has to be asked. Jennifer is asking, are asymptomatic COVID positive patients non-infectious? Hi, so Sophie here. Um, this is a, is a difficult question. I think it needs to be taken into the context as to why the test was done in the first place. Um, we do know that asymptomatic and presymptomatic can have um, transmission. Um, from an epidemiological standpoint, it's a very difficult um, cohort of patients to be able to identify um, exactly what that transmission is. Um, and I know there are, there are ongoing studies. Um, the answer is it's unsure. It depends what test has been taken. If it's a rapid test PCR, um, we know that there can be shedding that can continue for up to eight weeks after um, the, the onset of the illness. So it really depends on which stage you are um, within that. Um, so the answer is, is it has to be taken within, within clinical context. Um, and and the, the safest thing in what WHO, and we'll come on to this on Wednesday, is that um, from the date of a positive um, of PCR um, would be to take 10 days after that time as being positive, even though they may not be. Thanks. All right. So um, I'm seeing here a question that I can answer. Can you provide a transcript of the Q&A along with the slides? Um, transcript, maybe not, because it might entail a bit more effort of transcribing, but we will present, uh, we will put the recordings of the webinar definitely online. So you will be able to have access to these uh, Q&As as they are uh, spoken. Now, um, Let's go into the ethics questions. So Patrick Lozano is asking, um, once the vaccine is available, how can we approach its distribution and prioritization to different countries and different groups of people? For example, healthcare workers, elderly, low socioeconomic status, etc. What's the ethical way of going about it? Over. So the recommendation is that these uh, scarce, if you're talk, asking about scarce resource allocation and the ethics um, for that, um, it should be developed um, at the institution level, at the facility level. And it should be guided by principles. And then those three principles um, are utility, um, life years, and life cycle. Those are the three main, and there are, there are other considerations. Um, the recommendation is to utilize those ethical principles and developing both a short-term and a long-term um, survival and making your uh, scarce resource allocation based off of that. Okay, so this one is a specific question on ethics. Um, I once encountered, uh, so an anonymous attendee is asking, I once encountered a survey where it was asked, if I would switch the equipment being used to keep a child with COVID alive with an elderly patient with the same disease uh, and in need of urgent attention, 
or vice versa. So what are your thoughts on this? I remember that you did have a slide on this, uh, Gary, something about life years or maybe yes. a comment. So, so once again, your institution should develop their own scarce resource allocation. Um, yeah, it's difficult for you to make that decision um, on your own. Um, you should have a uh, institutional scarce resource allocation protocol. And also the recommendation is at least one way to do it is the person that makes that decision is different than the person that actually is providing the care. That is the uh, recommendation that you should have this in place. And yes, you're right. It is the principle that is recommended by WHO is the life cycle. So um, from the principal life cycle, you would prioritize the patient that has not been able to go through, live through their all their life phases, and that's children. Okay, so um, Irvina is asking a question. I'll soften the question a bit, but you will always be able to read it in the box. So have there been deviations from the mentioned ethical principles by healthcare providers and frontliners in countries overwhelmed with COVID cases? So have we received reports from other countries where they did have to do this prioritization of one patient over the other? Uh, what ethical principles did they use, like actual cases? Do we have such information? So um, we have a global clinical um, expert call twice a week. And then these clinicians, they have shared some of their experiences. Um, and we have, I have heard of some instances where they had to uh, make some decisions regarding older persons and also children, um, very similar to what you had just mentioned, um, especially when their institution didn't have a specific scarce source re you know, allocation protocol in place or they were developing one. Um, also, it did seem that it was the same person um, that was interpreting the scarce resource allocation protocol and the providing the care um, in many cases. All right, um, just for a little bit of variety, but still relevant to our, okay, the question moved a bit, but uh, from memory, I recall, someone here was asking about do we have WHO guidelines when it comes to mass gatherings? Okay, here's the exact question. Good morning. Sorry you may view this as more of a political issue, but public health is seriously compromised by people joining rallies or protests in various countries around the world. Any recommendations by the WHO uh, for the government as to its impact on public health, such as precautionary measures? Before Gary and Sophie answers, uh, there is a press release already by the Director General himself that doesn't endorse any political positions, but gives caution. And maybe that's what uh, Gary and uh, Sophie can like uh, speak on. So if there is uh, inevitably going to be a mass gathering, is, is there, are there guidelines out there? Thanks. Um, I think leading on from, from your response, Albert, it is really just, um, providing what we would say in terms of the physical distancing, hand hygiene, um, if you're in a situation where um, you're not going to be able to maintain physical distancing using masks um, and really highlighting that those who are unwell um, or, or know someone who's had COVID-19 to not attend um, those settings um, to, 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 to try and reduce transmission, but um, agree that, that we, we, we can't provide any um, guidance on in, in terms of um, sort of from a political standpoint. Thanks. All right. Desiree Johnson is asking back to the clinical management of four principles. So would you recommend shifting hypertensive patients on maintenance medications to shift to uh, ACE inhibitors, uh, angiotensin uh, converting enzyme inhibitors when diagnosed with mild to moderate COVID? Over. The, the recent evidence has not indicated that uh, ACE inhibitors um, either help or significantly hurt um, patients with COVID-19. Um, the current recommendation is if the patient's already on their uh, antihypertensive, which includes an ACE inhibitor, then you should continue that. 
but not to start a new antihypertensive um, with ACE inhibitor, unless uh, otherwise indicated. All right, Gary and Sophie, is it okay if we extend just for a few minutes? There are still a few questions, but they seem to be pertinent. All right, so um, Rick Zen Villa is asking, it is announced previously that the Philippines is already in the rainy season, um, but I guess that this will also apply to other countries that have leptospirosis. Would there be any guidelines or recommendations in possible co-infection of leptospirosis and COVID-19? So currently, there's not any specific guidance on uh, leptospirosis in the in the new uh, um, guidelines. Um, of course, you know, watching for the um, organ failures that occur with uh, leptospirosis um, would be uh, very important. Um, but uh, currently, there's nothing about uh, leptospirosis uh, as a co-infection uh, with COVID-19. All right. So, um, sorry, I'll just add to that, Albert. Um, Go ahead. Just in, in terms of co infections or alternative diagnoses. So, um, with the rainy season and, and dengue um, and leptospirosis. So, um, it's, it's just always keeping in, in the back of your mind that whilst we have this pandemic going on, there, there can be um, infections that occur um, individually. So, just keeping that, that, that um, wider view. Thanks. Right. So the next two questions are related. Um, Kat D. Lee and an anonymous attendee are asking, um, since no evidence of a nebulizer being an aerosolizing uh, procedure exists, no evidence exists, is it already safe to use it for asthmatic patients in exacerbation in clinics and the ER? And the other one, which may be related, is um, would you recommend the use of oxygen therapy or nebulization in a clinic setup if warranted? Is it sufficient for the staff to wear an N95 uh, respirator in this scenario? Over. So currently the uh, nebulizer treatment is not um, found. There's, no, there's not sufficient evidence to classify it as an aerosol generating procedure. So, uh, and there's some evidence, but insufficient for things like non-invasive and hypronasal cannula. So for specifically for nebulizer treatment, um, you should probably treat it as you would for high flow oxygen through a Venturi mask or um, high flow oxygen through a mask with reservoir, um, because you're gonna be using some of those same interfaces. And there is, uh, you know, air that can come out through the ports on the side, um, like uh, like it does with the uh, nebulizer treatments. But uh, the current guidance is that uh, you do not need to use um, airborne precautions um, um, with the uh, nebulizer treatments specifically. All right. Um, so. Here we go. Um, do you have insights or new updates and guidelines for returning to work and COVID-19 screening among workers or employees with mild ARI symptoms? So if, if we have a, a lot, we have countries reopening the economy, so to speak, with workers coming back, what has been the guidance, if any, or uh, practices um, about this? What, what tests are used or uh, do you have screening? Over. Hi, so Sophie here. Um, just update on guidance for return to work. Um, if you have mild um, sort of acute respiratory infection symptoms, then the advice would be not to return to work. Um, masks are not adequate. Um, so it really is stay at home um, and, and isolate yourself and be tested so that you can perform adequate contact tracing. Um, the, the next um, step from that is um, to, to stay at work at home for at least 10 days from which the symptoms first started um, as well. So I think you need to just go down, down the usual route, um, but the first, the first instance with, with any even mild symptoms would be to stay at home, isolate and, and um, proceed for testing. All right, so the time is now 12.04 and mindful of the time. Um, I'm just gonna run through the questions and quick uh, give quick answers. So an anonymous attendee is asking if there are any guidelines for HIV AIDS cases. So uh, Dr. Sophie gave, an, uh, I think it was Gary or Sophie, you mentioned a while ago that 
there are no specific like co-infection guidelines, but always uh, keep in mind the four principles, uh, especially when it comes to the disease that is co-infecting uh, COVID-19. So keep, keep that in mind and also watch out for later updates as we move along. And then um, there are questions here on uh, testing. So is it prudent to recommend testing of a healthcare worker who is about to return to outpatient clinics? So uh, drawing from what Sophie gave, uh, the answer on returning to work, so it still is uh, really about uh, being mindful of any symptoms. Um, and maybe this is something that you could clarify, Sophie or Gary. What if the worker is asymptomatic? So is it still going to be, let's test the worker? Or do we do a history of the past 10 days? How do, how do we go about this? So it's about risk stratifying and doing an assessment. So if the patient, sorry, if the, if the health worker is asymptomatic, um, and doesn't have any contact with anybody, hasn't been at uh, any increased high risk areas, hasn't had any exposure to patients um, in the last 14 days that would put them at increased risk. Um, so they're not within an incubation period for having it. Um, there is no indication to test them um, prior to returning to work. Um, it's always to be um, within the healthcare facility um, to, to, to be mindful for any symptoms, um, temperature checks um, and 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 I think in a lot of institutions um, uh, and what, what is being brought in is the use of masks um, within the healthcare facility. So um, even if you were asymptomatic um, with potential um, transmission, which is unlikely, but if you're wearing a mask and practicing hand hygiene um, and physical distancing, then, then this greatly, greatly reduces the risk of transmission. Thanks. All right, uh, and then uh, Matt Bell's question is, as a private medical practitioner in a community with a nearby COVID-19 positive patient who refused to be taken to a quarantine facility, what can I do to protect the community knowing that the patient's house is not the ideal setting? Um, I'll be able to give the answer here. So there are Philippine guidelines when it comes to um, as asymptomatic uh, patients. Um, there are actually quarantine guidelines, and maybe we just need to remind to uh, communicate with the municipal health officer that even asymptomatic patients, as long as they are confirmed positive, have to be isolated, especially if the house is not capable of doing isolation properly. And then the last two questions, um, Dr. Vero DG is asking for medications used for deep sedation. So I think uh, we may be able to just, uh, you know, give you guidance. If you could just email me directly, you do have my email through the invitation and we can always reply to you uh, with uh, links uh, to the specific uh, answers for that. And then uh, last question um, from Lucien Bernal. Uh, Gary or Sophie could probably have an answer. Um, internationally, uh, has WHO endorsed any contact tracing apps, application software? Over. I don't know the answer to that one. Any insights, Sophie? I, I don't either, I'm afraid. Um, I know that, that governments have been endorsing them, but I'm, I'm not sure the WHO's um, standpoint on that. Right, so I, I actually concur with the two. So from a Philippine standpoint, uh, WHO is working with the DOH on particular apps, uh, but we do not give like endorsement. It's, it is always up to the government to endorse which one is being used uh, for a particular local setting. All right, so thank you so much. The time is 12.08. We are thankful for all 421 uh, who still stayed on despite the overtime, but at a certain point, we did have 482 attendees. And uh, just a reminder, um, this is a series. So today was like uh, the updates uh, from the May 27 release of the clinical management guidelines. And then um, tomorrow, Tuesday, we will have a guest speaker, um, Dr. Albert Albay, who will be speaking on the experience of the Philippine General Hospital. For our colleagues uh, internationally, this is the National uh, Referral Hospital of the Philippines, uh, PGH, one of the three large hospitals designated for COVID-19 public hospitals. And then on Wednesday, uh, we will have a discussion on the updated discharge criteria. Um, what uh, Dr. Sophie already mentioned, that WHO has some guidance that we don't need an RT-PCR test anymore so long as you have 10 days of symptom-free. Um, so more details on that on Wednesday. And then on Thursday, we will have uh, Dr. Saibel Abad from the Medical City here in Manila. It's a large uh, private hospital that has also been managing COVID patients. And on Friday, uh, your questions on the management of uh, children and even pregnant patients uh, 
who may have COVID will be uh, discussed. Uh, that's on uh, Friday together with UNICEF and UNFPA joining us. So thank you so much for everyone and we hope that you'll have a great day uh, wherever you are here in Manila or uh, anywhere else uh, worldwide and stay safe. Good morning, good afternoon.